Thank you, Maharaj, for joining today for this podcast. It's an honor to have you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to, to join you from Poland. Yes, Maharaj. Um, I've read especially several of your books. Of course, I read first thing that I read about, about you was your DT worship uh, master's thesis which broadened my understanding of deity worship. Then I've read several of your other articles and I have appreciated how that you bring both devotional fidelity and intellectual rigor together. So maybe we could discuss that as a launching pad for our discussion today. Okay. Yes, yeah. So, you know, maybe you can tell how you, know, you were a leader in our movement for a long time and then you chose to go into academia for uh, doing expanding your study and outreach so can you tell us a little background of what inspired you to do that okay um i was um i got involved in preparation of uh, the iskan deity worship manual called pancharatra pradipa uh, in the early 90s in Mayapur. Uh, and I was asked to be the main organizer of that, the chairperson. We had a committee with uh, five or six devotees. And um, so that involved various functions, ga gathering together uh, research, work and um, coordinating and so on. And mm, most practically, yeah, I would say all, all of the Sanskrit translation work uh, was being done by His Holiness Banu Swami. Um, and this was all extremely valuable. Um, he was part of this team. But as I was doing this work, one of my concerns was my own lack of Sanskrit knowledge. I felt, um, you know, I'm supposed to be doing this compilation and who am I? <laughs> what is my, I don't even know uh, really basic Sanskrit, so I'm depending on others, but okay, I did the best I could. But this, uh, there was a gradual increase of feeling I had that I would like to get some kind of training in Sanskrit. And uh, I was exploring what are the different options. There were some devotees in Vrindavan who were teaching Harinam Amrita Vyakaran of Jiva Goswami and um, yeah, that looked interesting, but I wasn't so sure, is that the way to go? And then I met His Holiness Sri Dayananda Das Goswami. Um, and over a period of two, maybe three years, he was encouraging me uh, to go back to university because I had... Uh, been a university student, um, a dropout really, before I joined the devotees. I was at University of California in Berkeley. Uh, he said, why don't you go back to school, back to university, you can study Sanskrit there, and uh, you, can, you can get, um, as he put it, you'll get credit for it. <laughs> His point was you can get a degree, you can get other degrees which will be recognized in the wider world. And being recognized in the wider world, uh, you'll be a person that, you know, people may listen to outside of the small circle of, of devotees. Uh, long story short, I was persuaded not only by him, but um, uh, eventually by His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami to, to make the, the leap, 
Now, in in those days, it was much more of a leap than it is today in terms of ISKCON ethos. Which uh, year was to go. That? This was 1995. I finally, finally decided to. I decided I will try. Let me see how I do. Let me take one semester and see how I manage. <laughs> so I, it was easy to get back into University of California. Uh, simultaneously, I transferred campus um, from Berkeley to Santa Barbara be because Santa Barbara has uh, the largest department of uh, religious studies on the western side of the USA. They have a very large department. And they, ha they have Sanskrit uh, training and other South Asian languages. So um, that was 1995, and I continued. First, I had to finish my undergraduate degree, <laughs> which I did as a marathon. Uh, I sort of squeezed two years into a little over one year. And then I trans I uh, applied for a master's program at uh, a, a private institution. It's called the Graduate Theological Union yeah. in Berkeley. It's just uh, it's just two blocks away from the university. Um, this is essentially uh, a Christian institution but they were offering a degree, a degree in uh, the study of religion as, as a secular course. Mm -hmm. So I took that. Uh, I did two-year master's degree course full-time. It was very intense. Uh, and then, um, yeah, then I ended up at, at Oxford. Oh, okay. So during these years, when you say full-time, you you had uh, suspended your normal services in uh, ISKCON at that time, or you're continuing those also? It must have been very difficult. Um, it was sort of half and half. My, my duties in ISKCON, uh, by this time, well, I had finished up uh, this project of uh, compiling Pancharatra Pradeep. Uh, we managed to get it pub uh, printed in uh, the Mayapur BBT. <laughs> uh, and uh, one, one duty I had, uh, I was, around this time I was asked to be the ISKCON Minister of Deity Worship. Uh, so I was, I was doing what I could for that service, but it was quite minimal uh, because of my studies, and I didn't feel happy about that. Uh, so I, w I was quite happy uh, when uh, it became possible to pass on that duty, uh, which I, I did, I think it was 2005, uh, to um, Singh Kavacha Prabhu, yeah. who has he has really taken it, you know, very seriously, and he's very active, and he's done amazing things with the ministry. Uh, my other duties were, um, you could say, just traveling and preaching, as we say, mainly in Europe, uh, East Europe. And what I did is each summer, I came back to Europe and traveled as much as I could visited devotees, temples, um, gave lectures, talks. And I kept up, I kept up correspondence uh, pretty well. And um, yeah, that was about all that I had to do other than uh, the, the, the academic work. So somehow it worked out. Amazing. So, <laughs> so, you, so when you, originally you said that you could also reach a broader audience beyond the ISKCON devotee audience. 
so yeah do you feel that after having completed the doctorate now through your books or through your uh, seminars or others you are able to reach a significantly broader audience i think so yes um at one example um now i give a little plug for my latest book uh <laughs> cow care in hindu animal ethics because we managed to get the book um published on what's called open access platform mm. uh through uh, the publisher which is an international academic publisher um up until now this is now 6 months maybe going on 7 months uh the book's been out and it's been downloaded digital download because it's available free of charge it's been downloaded 31000 times 31000 that's a big number very big okay so that's you know that's reaching um some but somebody is hopefully okay they're downloading the book hopefully somebody's reading the book also <laughs> uh yeah also uh immediately was it immediately no i i stayed in oxford for another year i did post doctoral uh study preparing my doctoral thesis for publication after that um i had opportunity to teach at the university of florida as as a uh adjunct faculty for two semesters um and then through that uh there was uh one conference that I took part in and then after that one year I came back to oxford and was planning to settle in oxford more and then I got a call inviting me to come teach at Chinese University of Hong Kong uh that ended up being f- on and off 5 years uh and and that has led to other w- one thing sort of leads to another uh the 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 people you get to know and the contacts um it was very nice and yes through that we can say i uh it's also become possible i've been visiting mainland china uh the last um what is it now 8 years oh okay. 7 years because i missed this year <laughs> because of the pandemic um and because of my i mean very specifically because of my academic qualification Mm. um plus my i think also important has been where i got my app- qualification oxford um all over asia the the name aja uh the name oxford has has a lot of ring a lot of resonant resonance mm. uh, if you say you're from oxford oh you're from oxford oh okay uh the doors are opening so i've had a lot of opportunity giving lectures in universities in china um uh, on all kinds of subjects related to uh indian culture and um indian tradition i have to be very careful there because uh they're very nervous about religion talking about religion is um yeah it has to be done in very careful ways <laughs> that's my right that's amazing so uh, when these more bigger doors open then do we also have to say reconceptualize our definition of outreach because here it won't be so much like making people into devotees is it more of yeah. enhancing broadening the awareness and perspectives or how do you uh, what is the conception of um, outreach through such any you know any any through such forums or do you call yeah. it what do you what would you call it as i call it teaching <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> not so much preaching as teaching 
Uh, and also, you know, lately, I don't know in India if it's the case, but uh, somewhat in the West, uh, there's been discussion among devotees about uh, what's being called bridge preaching. Yeah. And uh, some devotees have expressed concern that uh, what is this, what is the value uh, of, you know, this uh, bridge preaching, which they are, uh, those who are expressing concern, the concern is that it's so indirect uh, that it's perhaps watering down the message uh, and perhaps ultimately losing the message. <laughs> Uh, in something else, which are all legitimate concerns. But when I, some years ago, I was thinking about this, uh, this image of the bridge. And it occurred to me that our whole tradition is a tradition of bridging, of bridge preaching. This is what we are about. And if you read Chaitanya Charitamrita uh, with this in mind, you'll see that what is Lord Chaitanya doing all the time? He is bridge preaching. <laughs> so it's really a question of whether we're making good bridges that are actually crossing various gaps uh, to use this analogy, uh, and facilitating for people to cross over the bridge to Krishna consciousness, or are you building that are going nowhere? But bridging is itself, I think, what we are all about. Uh, um, when we use, when you use the word, uh, it's bridge. and I like to also say that without, without the counterpart to outreach, which is in reach, mm. Mm, to uh, become Krishna conscious is to become also uh, conscious of ourselves ourselves conscious within uh, becoming uh, more deeply reflective about ourselves in Krishna consciousness, the two go together because uh, if it's outreach all the time, uh, eventually it's not going to be an effective bridge anymore. And of course, for this, we have our, our sadhana, but sadhana, which is not Reflective sadhana may may not be as effective as uh, as as more re consciously reflective. Yes, Maharaj, it is a, is a beautiful concept that in one sense all kind of preaching or teaching is bridging. In fact, one of the names of Vishnu in Vish, of Vishnu in Vishnu Sahasranam is Jagata Setu. Setu is a bridge. Yes. So he. Right. So in fact, the whole world is like a bridge to return to Vishnu. So yes, that also, yeah. Super, that's beautiful. So <laughs> just expanding this point that when we are doing, you're saying about building effective bridges. So generally, it seems that the broader the audience we want to reach, it is more and more likely that the smaller the steps up this bridge of consciousness, or if you want to take the bridge as a, like a pyramid or going up a mountain, say if we do classes in the temple, we reach to a smaller audience, but we can give a more direct Krishna conscious message. When we are reaching out, say even to the academic audience, there was a phase in my life, probably between, between 2003 to 2010, when I was exploring which direction I should go. I joined as a Brahmachari in 1996. So I also ex explored the option of academic outreach. And I talked with my guides and I felt that I could, my interest was more in writing. And I have tried to reach out to mainstream academic publishers, not academic publishers, mainstream trade publishers, you might say. And I've been able to get some books there. 
but one of the challenges i found is that there is a significant amount of critical examination of the tradition within the uh, academic study and that can be quite at one sense challenging for one's faith so in another sense you could also say that the what we learn within the tradition or the way things are taught can sometimes make it seem that we have to choose between reason and faith so mm -hmm. that's why i started by saying that there there is this intellectual rigor and devotional fidelity that you i seen that being brought together in your books so did you face this challenge and or how how do you deal with this challenge in your either your study or your teaching um yeah i would say the challenge has been there from day one before when i first joined the temple um and a nice a, a statement that i've always appreciated since i read it uh from one uh very senior christian theologian um <clears throat> is that he said faith is always in dialogue with doubt faith is always in dialogue with doubt but doubt now we often that's interesting now we often hear no doubt doubts are demons and we hear that uh to have doubt means that one's faith is you know not not solid and so on so the the location of the doubt might not be within oneself it might be uh in the form of another person or it might be partially within and partially without it can be you know many <laughs> uh configurations <clears throat> you say within another uh, but, person, just a minute to clarify when you say within another person means that that person is the other words you may let's say you meet an atheist hmm? okay and he is a convinced atheist okay so now you are exchanging speaking so now you are the person of faith who is in dialogue with the person in of doubt. doubt okay but, but the dialogue the broad, could be yeah this dialogue could be internal also then with the with dialogue that. can be internal also okay yes maharaj that's beautiful thought yeah so i'm saying that you know that's been there since day 1 <laughs> or even before i i i joined the devotees but i think that uh with um the engagement in the academic world mm. uh i i was given a more sophisticated uh facilitation of of uh thinking about how to do this dialogue and i want to say we we sort of put uh on uh as a binary we we have faith on one side reason uh on the other the tradition of theology as it's known in the west which was mainly developed uh in medieval christian europe is is exactly this concern how do we apply reason to faith mm. that was the whole project of uh of of theology since um since the 11th 12th century uh in europe Thomas Aquinas was a pioneer among that isn't he? He was he was like Thomas Aquinas was he was like the Jiva Goswami of the oh. Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> okay. Um because he wasn't so much a pioneer the pioneers were others uh in the previous century but he was more the culmination. Oh. Um in the in the 13th century um with his uh summa theologica yeah. theologia um which was his attempt to sort of bring um Aris, aristotelian aristotelian 
philosophy and Christian theology uh, to bring them together. That was his whole project. How successful he was uh, is debated, and, and then the whole project kind of collapsed uh, with the famous William of Ockham. William of Ockham with his Ockham's razor, where he yeah. sort of uh, made it a principle that we should question um, any statement, any theological statement that is uh, superfluous, which is not based on uh, something we can point to as definitely true. And you, you could say that's sort of the early form of 20th century positivism. But anyway, um, my point is that theology is a practice that's been going on in the West since centuries. Hmm. And, um, and this is a practice of bringing faith and reason together. Now, we also have this in our tradition. It goes back also centuries. Um, the whole commentarial tradition, uh, we can say is a tradition, a theological tradition of reflecting on, uh, on doctrine, reflecting on uh, principles of faith, and uh, applying reason to them. And so we have... And so we have the works of Jiva Goswami, for example, and Srila Rupa Goswami, all the Goswamis, but also long before them, of course, we have the Vaishnava Acharyas, uh, all of them, uh, Ramanuja Acharya, they were doing theology. So the, the, the challenge is on one level to... Uh, to update uh, this practice, to, uh, to apply sometimes modern language and to comprehend uh, contemporary issues, contemporary theological, philosophical, social issues, uh, the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. And then with a, a clear understanding of uh, what are the concerns to see how Christian consciousness can address those concerns. Yes, Maharaj. At one level, this is the, what attracted me to Krishna consciousness also that we had rational answers to life's basic questions. Say, for right. example, the existence of soul, existence of God, and then the problem of evil, to some extent, at least karma provides a reasonable explanation. Now, there is reason applied up to a particular level. And then afterward, so at least this was my experience. And what you said about getting more sophisticated ways of doing the dialogue between faith and doubt, that I, although I have not gotten the academy by studying the works of uh, devotee academics as well as other academic books. I also got some resources for this. Now, mm. so I'll just give an, if you're okay, I'll give an example of this, then I, maybe we can, that can yes. further. So, you know, I read, I read Shri Prabhupada's Lila Amrut and that was the book that inspired me to dedicate my life to, uh, to Prabhupada's movement. And then over the years, as I reread it again, there are some statements which, which I found it difficult to digest. So, for example, in one place in the Lila Amro, that is said that Prabhupada says that by 2000, there will be so much pollution on the earth that nobody will, live on the sur nobody will be able to live on the surface of the earth. Everybody will have to live like rats underground. Now, when I read that, I just couldn't understand this. Then I asked, <laughs> so then I asked one of my prominent spiritual guides and he told me that uh, for one who has faith, all questions will be answered from within. The, the, the verse yesterday, Yatha Devi, Yatha Guru. 
and then mm. the fact that you are having this kind of doubts means that you are on the track of falling down from spiritual life and then after that he said that he gave us i gave some example that in america in some places the whole city has been uh, one small or one small part of a city has been made into like a a greenhouse where it's completely covered and insulated that because it becomes the temperature extremes are too much so i said that is not what prabhupada is saying over here so mm -hmm. i so i there are several statements like this which i found very difficult to understand and i felt mm -hmm. almost tormented that i have to give up we had to give up my common sense my intelligence to accept this and then i i think i read an article by ravindra swarup prabhu in one of his academic papers where he made this very simple point that even an acharya can learn some things from non scriptural sources and then one nagraj prabhu told me that how the state day when prabhupad had made this statement two days before a devotee had given prabhupad a doomsday prophecy uh, like a climate a doomsday prophecy report he had read out for to prabhupad and that report had said that by 2000 nobody will be able to live on the surface of the earth ah <laughs> so Pra so prabhupad was just quoting prabhupad that. was quoting that <laughs> yeah so now this is such a simple point but i had till then i had the idea that having faith in acharya in acharya means accepting every statement of that acharya without questioning so the i felt actually quite uh, uh, i felt quite uh, angry that i had been subjected to so much intellectual torture if i may use that word <laughs> because of not <laughs> simple principle so intellectual torture i like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> intellectual abuse maybe <laughs> yeah that's true so so now within our so this is the example and in india generally uh, many devotees who have some questions they come to me and they and i try to answer their questions even many many of our devotee pre preachers teachers if they have some students who are more intellectual and they have some questions they send those people to me to my website or to me personally and then i try to address their questions so i find that most of the devotee community most of the people who come to our movement don't have too many complicated questions but some do have and sometimes their their intellectual needs are not addressed they are simply labeled as doubters so one of the this brings me to both the question as well as the paper which i found say i got some explanations for various contentious issues but one of the few places where i had seen an approach for dealing with such contentious issues is your paper on constructive theologizing so maybe if you want you could address that also but the question i had through all this is that within our tradition itself for people who are directly coming to our movement but those who have more doubts or we could say greater intellectual needs what resources are available for facilitating this dialogue between faith and doubt or what resources can we provide them mm. yeah that's a nice question and i think the short answer is uh that's a work in progress um shila prabhupad conceived as i see it he conceived of his movement um in many ways first and foremost as an educational uh mission because he in his at least one of his very early articles like 1944 back to godhead he would speak he he wrote that uh temples should be places of education and uh that has sort of resonated with me over the years and i've therefore been concerned that we develop educational uh facilities within our society beginning from preschool and going through tertiary education uh but these things take time and we are um still a very young society um uh, and we're dealing with i like to say we are uh, very much on 
uh, uncharted territory in the sense of bringing a tradition from India that's uh, centuries and millennia old uh, out of India uh, and trying to um, not just spread superficially, but uh, to actually sink roots into other societies takes time. Uh, if we look at uh, the spread of Buddhism in China, for example, uh, the, the early uh, stages of that spread w were in the early centuries of the Common Era, um, and it's a, it was a process that took, you know, several centuries. Uh, and you could say it's something which is ongoing in China. There's, um, there's, there's all kinds of, um, yeah, discussion going on within Chinese society on, on, on Buddhism, um, <clears throat> and um, so we are just very, we are very young. And we have a long way to go in terms of uh, developing good resources uh, for uh, devotees who want to delve a bit more deeply and uh, are not so satisfied with the, the simplified answers and not so satisfied with the polarity of, um, you know, a kind of I believe or I don't believe, um, there's faith, there's doubt. Um, a lot of the argumentation, the discussion that goes on among devotees is unfortunately in this polarized form, that there's a kind of either or understanding and there's no real um, careful thinking about well, maybe there's something of valid, of, maybe there's validity to what's being said on both sides. So maybe we need to use our intelligence to find uh, some sort of middle ground. And what's also missing is uh, there's a lot of lack of knowledge of Shastra. <laughs> Even we may be reading so much over so many years. Um, I've been struck by this recently uh, just by hearing occasionally Hari Parshad Prabhu uh, in Mumbai, who is very knowledgeable of Shastra. Uh, and things that he brings up uh, are just so illuminating. Uh, when you're struggling with some question, then suddenly he's there with a quote <laughs> straight from Shastra that just Bling makes it all very clear. So that is a, that's a, uh, something that takes time for there to be more scholars on the sort of traditional pundit side. Um, there's there's need for that. There's more. There's need for more scholarship on the more wet, I would say modern Western side uh, to be in tune with the kind of thinking that goes on. For example, you mentioned uh, the, the reasoning which we accept for the existence of Atma, of the self. Um, yes, that is there. And there's a huge literature, which much of it is based in Buddhism, of course, where Anatmavada uh, is one of their kind of cornerstones. Although if you read, if you read more carefully, you see that in fact, um, this was never in Buddhism clearly established. It was never clearly established that there is no soul. And to the present day, some scholars I've read say it's still a matter of debate. So to know that, it, it requires. Um, devotees who really spend time uh, to get to know what are the what are the current discussions 
Uh, a third thing I would mention, uh, I'd like to mention that's um, perhaps encouraging or inspiring for devotees. It's something which is now in the works uh, and will soon become available. And that is a course um, which is being prepared uh, under the auspices of the GBC Shastra Advisory Council, uh, of which I'm uh, a, uh, what do you say, an advisory member. Um, and um, this course is a course on Vaishnava hermeneutics. Now, most devotees don't know what the word hermeneutics means, uh, and we can be forgiven for that. Uh, hermeneutics basically is the study of the discussion about interpretation. How do we interpret what we read, what we hear? And of course, some devotees will jump and say, wait, 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 we don't need that at all because Srila Prabhupada said several times, there is no need of interpretation. Uh, but if you look at that statement a little more uh, carefully, you see what Prabhupada is saying is if a statement, um, if a literal, if the literal interpretation of a statement is clear and meaningful and makes sense in the context, then there's no need for further interpretation. Um, but to say there's no need of interpretation is itself an interpretation. Yeah. You, can, you cannot avoid. So what uh, the GBC requested us, and this has been over a period of years now, uh, the Shastra Advisory Council to develop, and you know this very well because you're involved, <laughs> uh, is to develop uh, uh, Mm. resources and then a, a program so devotees can become expert in understanding how do we deal with Shastra. We see here's one statement in Shastra and over here is another statement and they seem to conflict. What do we do with that? Um, do we just pile up quotes and throw them at someone we don't like? Or how do we come to a clear understanding? So the idea is there's a, a skill of interpretation. And uh, we want to facilitate that this can be brought for devotees. And it, it will be an ongoing process. It will certainly be over, um, over, it can be over a very long time that this course becomes refined, becomes improved, uh, becomes enriched until we get really expert teachers of the course and so on. Okay. Yes, this is quite systematic, these three points you mentioned. Now, when you talk about, say, a more sophisticated dialogue between uh, faith and doubt, uh, is it possible for you to give any examples? Maybe from either some of your writings, you mentioned your book on cow, on cow care, maybe you could give some examples from there. So also, okay. you, you okay. or you can introduce the concept of constructive theologizing in one of your papers. Maybe you could ex yeah. explain that. And uh, so this is, you know, how, say for, for example, as devotees, and they have doubts, as you said earlier, doubts are seen as demons. On the other yeah. hand, in the academic uh, context, often doubt is seen as an intellectual virtue, that you are not gullible, yes. that you don't just believe. So I would say that yeah. there's almost a polarized view of doubt as a spiritual failing and doubt as an intellectual virtue. So... How, how can you give examples of how these two could be in dialogue and how that could lead to a better understanding? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, we can start with my book on cows, I suppose. <laughs> yes. uh, one of the subjects I discuss in the book is uh, veganism. Hmm. 
uh, which has become something of a uh, a fairly hot topic uh, amongst devotees. Mm. And um, of course, it, that's a result of uh, a very strong promotion, a uh, very vocal uh, presence of uh, people who call themselves vegan. Uh, and uh, we can say in the in the West, especially, there's a significant movement of uh, veganism. The idea that uh, not just being vegetarian, but avoiding all animal products, is uh, is the is the right thing to do from various for various reasons, uh, not least um, ethical reasons. Um, so, yeah, maybe I start uh, with a bit from my own personal situation. A few years back, my doctor, who's a devotee, advised me uh, um, that considering my age and other things, uh, it would actually be best if I would become not necessarily 100%, but uh, mainly vegan, that I should... Uh, avoid taking milk products would be good for my health. And I immediately accepted. I just felt, yes, um, if that's the case, then so be it. And so I began uh, making that my, my standard, avoiding uh, really 90, I don't know, 98 percent. I I basically, I just stopped taking milk products, dairy. Um, <clears throat> and, well, I felt physically better <laughs> as a result. Um, and also I felt, um, I felt kind of ethically better, if you like, because I understood that uh, the dairy that we, that we all take from uh, from the supermarket, where it's coming from, uh, it's pretty obvious if we think about it, uh, that uh, the commercial dairies are, I mean, this sounds a little rhetorical, but I, I, I see it that they are, in a sense, extensions of the meat industry. Uh, because uh, as soon as, as a milk cow as soon as her milk yield uh, begins to reduce, she is sent for slaughter. Mm. Um, and so I didn't feel very good about this. And so stopped to, while I was avoiding, uh, I, felt, I felt better. And then came this uh, opportunity to write this book. And I saw, okay, now, I'm going to have to really deal with this subject because here we have our uh, tradition, which people identify as Hindu, although I think it's better to just say South Asian, uh, tradition of um, high regard for cows such that um, they should not be slaughtered. Hmm. And, and along with it, we have this understanding that, especially Christian devotees, we have to offer milk preparations to Krishna because um, they are very dear to Krishna. Krishna likes, uh, he likes his Rashkula <laughs> and Sandesh. <laughs> Okay. So I was, uh, I found myself, you know, needing to really think about this. So in the book, which is not addressed directly to devotees, although I, I'm hoping devotees will read it because I think it can also uh, help to give a deeper understanding of our tradition and where we may go with it. Um, in I think it's chapter five, I discuss 
uh, the vegan argument. And what I say there is that actually they have a very good point. The vegans have up to a certain point, they have a very good point. And the point is that uh, no animals should be exploited, uh, abused, uh, and there is every danger, even for those who are claiming to be protecting cows, there's every danger that they're actually exploiting uh, the cows uh, by taking the milk. It may be in different ways. Um, you know, how much, how much are they giving of the milk to the calves? Um, um, various th there are various ways that they, they may be uh, abusing the cows. They may be keeping the cows throughout their natural lives, and that's, uh, that's the minimum, we can say, for the standard of cow protection we understand. Uh, but um, there may be other issues. So what I suggest in the book is that maybe devotees, those who uh, have value, put a lot of value in uh, cow protection and in dairy products, um, because we like to offer them to Krishna, Maybe we need to look again at how much milk we need. Okay. And uh, devotees have pointed out, actually, Bir Krishna Goswami makes this point. He, he read, Srila Prabhupada advised, devotees should drink one cup of milk per day. One cup, which is, uh, oh. I don't know, two, uh, what is the quantity? It's um, half a pint or something. Yeah, 250 ml probably at the most. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But we are making so much cheese and yogurt and this and that and, you know. <laughs> yes, and that's not healthy for us. When we, uh, eat, my doctor said the most difficult thing for us to digest is paneer. Oh, really? You know, we we all we all love paneer sabji, right? We <laughs> we fish out the paneer so we can have only paneer, <laughs> and that's the most difficult. You know that. That's what's that's what's creating the the kidney stones and so on. So, from the devotee perspective, I'm suggesting: what if we what if we think about significantly reducing the quantity of milk, uh, and then that milk which we uh, which we take, we take only from protected cows and however small amount that is, it becomes a very precious, a very precious, precious thing. It becomes a delicacy. And most of it, um, after we offer to Krishna, we give to our children. Because for children, it's important, they should be getting milk. Okay. The older we get, the less milk we need. That's my understanding. I'm not a nutritionist, but uh, the bit that I've read and heard, uh, the, the less milk we need. Um, and some argue uh, that actually we, we don't, in, a modern, in the modern situation, we don't need any milk. Uh, certain things that milk provide, we can get elsewhere. So, uh, and then what I'm saying to the vegans in my book is, uh, okay, let's look at your argument. You are saying 
uh, that um, to take uh, dairy, uh, to take the milk from the cows is exploitative, no matter what. Um, and so what you want to say is that um, ultimately, well, at least some uh, vegans uh, that are called abolitionists, they want to completely stop human relations with animals, period. Yes, a complete compartmentalization of existence. It's like that. I read about this, yes. So, uh, because they say as soon as we humans have anything to do with animals, we will exploit them. And why will we exploit them? Because we will, um, we will own them. It's a matter of the mentality of ownership. So I'm, I'm suggesting in this book that um, this may be, uh, you're not thinking this all the way through. <laughs> I don't elaborate so much, but uh, the, the question is, if we say absolutely no relation between humans and animals, um, how are we going to get our grains for making bread? So they may answer, well, well, we'll plow the field with a tractor. Oh, so you're, you're going to use fossil fuel. Um, what does that mean? What, what happened to uh, taking care of the environment? What is going to be the long-term consequence of that for the animals which you are leaving alone? Are they going to, if, if that's not going to change uh, the climate so that, you know, animal species are dying out and so on and so on. Uh, mm. So it has and to be, then, it has to be yeah. a kind of trade-off then between how much we say put the animals to work to some extent now or in the long run we endanger their survival. Yeah, uh, and and also, I bring in this idea of animal citizenship. Citizenship, uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you got that far in the chapter. Yeah, I, I read that. I read that. Yeah. It's a quite interesting. Maybe you could explain that concept. Because as, as you know, maybe in a highly populated country like India, even all humans don't have citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a difficult conception because we have a certain preconception pre uh, of what we mean by citizenship, uh, which grows out of, um, well, it, it grows out of enlight so-called enlightenment, European thought, and so on. Uh, but the idea is to uh, to stretch the notion of uh, citizenship to to honor, and this gets back to something Prabhupada would say several times uh, to honor the notion of praja mm -hmm. being protected by the king. Prabhupada would say the duty of the king was to protect protect the praja, and the praja, you could translate as creatures, uh, all, of, all of the creatures of his kingdom. Hmm. That's interesting because we have stories like say, where Maharaj Shibi or Maharaj Rantidev, they even protect the animals. Yeah. In a sense, if we consider that way, there might not have any registered system of uh, citizenship, but they are entitled to the protection. Yeah, um, of course, there are many, many different aspects to those stories one could go into. But, um, and I'm taking this idea of citizenship. It's not, I'm not inventing, I'm not inventing it. And of course, Prabhupada uh, is, is referring to it, but also modern uh, scholars. And I'm referring uh, to uh, two scholars in particular wrote, wrote a book called Zo Zoopolis, um, the, the, 
the uh, the the city state of animals. of animals, something like that. And they're going quite systematically into a kind of um, yeah, we might call it constructive um, constructive thought on the subject of animal um, animal rights specifically. And they go through nine aspects uh, of what they say would be important to think about uh, animal citizenship. So I discuss four out of those nine. Um, the first one uh, is to do with, uh, uh, with movement or freedom of movement. Mm. How do you deal with, you know, are we just going to have cows running around in the streets? Well, hey, that's been going on in India since centuries already. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you maybe saw, I put a photo in one bull that's being fed a whole big pot of rice in the street by one, uh, one local merchant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then one of the subjects is um, sex and breeding. How do we understand that in terms of citizenship? Um, I'm not thinking of the others at the moment, but there, there, there are two others. Oh, yeah, work is one of them. How do we understand work? And here the point is, again, the, uh, the more extreme uh, vegans will say that uh, to... To put an, an ox to work or a horse to work is, is um, slavery. It's, it's slavery. Yeah. And I'm suggesting uh, that's, that's an oversimplification. Uh, it's a use of a metaphor which becomes easily a misuse of the metaphor. Um, because uh, we, we can also turn it around to see animal as citizen having a sense of use in the wider world, having a sense of purpose, uh, which connects that um, particular being, that animal, uh, we would say, with dharma, which moves them up out of the sphere of being only an animal, as we know from Hito Badesh. Uh, how does that verse go? The, the animals and humans share four activities, eating, uh -huh. sleeping, mating, defending. Uh -huh. And ahara nidra bhaya maitanadi. And human beings are distinguished by one principle, which is dharma. Hmm. If we are able to engage without exploiting, uh, if we can engage bulls in work, uh, then they, uh, they are being brought into the circle uh, of, of dharma in a way which they would otherwise be deprived. That's a beautiful way of looking at it. So this requires a certain acceptance of spiritual metaphysics, that there is a circle of dharma and there is a concept of spiritual evolution. So, mm. but then, in a sense, we could say even in ordinary, citizen, ordinary citizenship also, a citizen has some responsibilities to the state. So if animals are also citizens, yes. then also then they need to be a part of the circle and then they right. could also have to have some contribution. So, yeah. Yeah. I think and they have a contribution and they are rewarded appropriately. They are protected. Mm. And Srila Prabhupada speaks about this with respect to milk. He says, you're taking their milk. So that makes them your, uh, your mother. So then you must protect them uh, throughout their lives. Otherwise, uh, it is very sinful. Mm. So, 
just uh, this is quite profound just backtracking we spoke a lot <laughs> so okay we, i'm trying to understand that we I, the question i raised was that about a dialogue between say faith and doubt so if i understand you right what you did was the traditional understanding of cow care you brought that in the dialogue with the contemporary ethics of uh, maybe animal care or veganism and then with, with in that dialogue there are both ways it's like a mirror by which uh, so the contemporary thought can offer us a mirror by which we reexamine our practices and the traditional thought can offer a mirror by which the contemporary vegan activists or animal right activists can re can maybe examine expand their understanding is that the broad understanding of yeah. that yeah i i i think you have a nice analogy there of the of the mirror um and for the vegans because it's not that all vegans are abolitionist vegans i think many uh in reading this they will say okay this is reasonable um now how do i get my um a him some milk my i want to i want to now now i want to be vegan but i also would like milk um how do i get milk from protected cows then what we need is to have in place a full program um including courses online course or whatever how to start a program of cow protection on different scales and that work is beginning uh because we have um there's a small group of devotees uh in the UK in Leicester Sitaram Prabhu and others uh have this it's a business they're uh, doing it as a business ahim some milk they're selling milk all over the UK they send it by post um and they're getting huge response despite the milk being much more expensive than what you buy in the shop people are willing to pay that money and they and now they're getting many people asking okay how do we do this now we want to have cows <laughs> amazing yeah so so also the uh the iskon ministry of cow protection and agriculture is also working on a course uh to um yeah to facilitate okay you're you're talking about all of this this is all nice uh philosophy and theology and whatever now how do we do it <laughs> so that that's the next step yes maraj you know and the economics of it is uh it's not simple the yeah. economics of this is not at all simple but I think what we want to say is that should not be the primary consideration. It has to be uh sustainable economically. Uh but uh there there may be different ways of of doing it so that it works. But that's um that's in effect that's where my book leaves off. I I can't I couldn't in this book uh enter into such details. Yes Maharaj the economics is a challenge in fact i had a discussion of veganism and uh, bhakti on the same podcast with bhakti rasamrut maharaj and he has inspired devotees in australia to do a similar project for cow care uh, protected cows so they went to local australian farmers and told them that if you make sure that you take care of these cows throughout your life we will pay for their milk and you don't use any artificial materials for feeding them or for increasing their yield or anything like that keep everything natural and then that project is near melbourne so from melbourne sydney perth brisbane all over australia milk is going now and yeah it, it's tough because as you said the charge of the cost of the milk becomes more but there is a increasing awareness all over the world about this so even devotees are also becoming uh, conscious of the kind of milk that we take 
And yes, it's also, it's also uh, since last year, um, a, G, a GBC resolution. It's it's not a it's not a law, but it's a it's an advisory <clears throat> resolution that uh, by by 2022, I don't know, John Moss to me, all temples of ISKCON uh, where deity worship is going on should have in place a plan of how they are going to um, convert to ahimsa, ahimsa milk only being offered to the deities. So Maharaj, you have been the deity worship minister also earlier, and now you are also into cow care. So there is the idea that to the worship, to the deities, we need to offer them many milk products. So is that like a mandate or just there's an opulent food, but it doesn't necessarily have to have lots of milk products within them? In uh, one of the temples that Srila Prabhupada said to take as, um, as a model for ISKCON is the Radharaman temple in Vrindavan. Okay. Radharaman temple uh, is the temple established by Srila Gopal Bhatta Goswami. And Srila Gopal Bhatta Goswami uh, was... Um, there's a controversy, but we've just recently heard it's definitive now as our Acharyas, as Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur said, Sanatan Goswami has written the Hari Bhakti Vilasa. But uh, I believe Gopal Bhatta Goswami was also involved. And the Hari Bhakti Vilasa is uh, our standard Shastra for deity worship. Mm -hmm. So for my doctoral research, I spent four months uh, living next to Radharaman Temple and um, observing their worship and meeting some of the uh, priests and interviewing them and learning just what is it that they do day by day. And I managed to get their uh, written um, daily prayoga in Brajbasa language and like that. So what I saw from that is their, their sort of specialty of the house uh, that uh, everyone likes to get the prasad of is this uh, kulia. Uh, this bo boiled down milk, sweet, uh, which I'm sure you know they they give out in little um, little clay pots, mm. and this is a kind of um, replication of uh, the pastime of Shirachor Gopinath. This is where that whole idea comes from. Okay, and beyond that. Um, I don't know. I didn't see a whole lot of uh, milk product being offered. Um, it's, it is mentioned that Krishna likes milk products. It, there are descriptions of his, uh, some of his meals, um, I think in Gopal Champu and so on. And there is mention. Um, so where it's possible, why not offer you know, <laughs> lots of milk if it's a himsa. And if it's not there, it's not there. Okay. So it's, it's more of a, it's not exactly like an injunction, it's more of a recommendation, you could say, if it's possible, do it, but it's not necessary. That's, that's my understanding. Okay. Yeah. Aside from that, each, each deity um, has specialty, specialties of how they are worshipped. Okay. So, for example, we know that Lord Jagannath likes to eat, and so he's offered 56 preparations every day hmm. uh, in huge pots. So that is the service to Jagannath. 
he is, you know, his hands are never dry and so on. <laughs> uh, the specialty of worship uh, for Radha Krishna, well, there are three things. There's Sringara, ornamentation and dress. Um, and then there's um, Boga offering. And the third thing is music. Okay. They they told me this in Radharaman Temple that uh, they call it Samaj Gayana, uh, singing in in a group before the deity, and therefore many times of the day you go in Radharaman Temple they're singing. Uh, so that's that's the specialty. So different deities uh, will have different specialties. Okay. Yes, much. And uh, so, going back to that point of uh, say, as we grow older, we may not need that much milk. So these are also, as you said, these are realities that might result from the way we live. We don't know how it was exactly in the past. So although yeah. milk, milk is an important part of our culture, uh, it need not be that that exact quantity or the exact thing. So I'm trying to understand this constructive theologizing means that something might be yes and something might be no, like black, white and black, but through reason or through interaction of traditional thought with contemporary thought, we might encounter various shades of gray. And then we might position ourselves in a particular, particular shade of gray, which <laughs> is not necessarily contradictory to the traditional understanding but brings that direct tradition and dialogue with the, with the contemporary situation. Is it like that? Yeah, that could be, that could be one, one way of understanding. Um, uh, what was it? I was just going to say something. Anyway, um, constructive theology, uh, you brought up that term, yeah. is, um, is where you're experiencing a particular current situation um, within the contingencies of, of the material world. And you look at our tradition, you look back at the tradition, and what do we see? We see Sadhu Shastra Guru hmm. as our sources of knowledge. And of course, Narutam Das said, Sadhu Shastra Guru Vakya, Kridaye Koriya Aikya, Satatam Bajibo Prema Maje, Madye, mm. Moje. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sadhu Shastra Guru Vakya, the, Vakya, the words of the Sadhu, the Shastra, and the Guru. Kridaye Koriya Aikya, may they become a unit, a singularity, one clear understanding, Hridaye, in my heart. In my heart, this is the prayer. He's not saying everybody's heart, he's saying in my heart. Hridaye, <laughs> Koriya, Aikya, and then what will be the result? Satatam Bajibo, Prema Maje. I will be absorbed in Krishna, love of Krishna, always, satatam. That's an interesting reading of this. So constructive, con constructive theology is saying, okay, here's a real situation in the present world. How do we deal with it? How do we draw from our own tradition to build, therefore this word construction, to build a solid foundation for action in which we feel genuinely connected to our tradition and we feel equally connected uh, to um, engagement in the um, present condi uh, conditioned or contingent world. So there's a conscious drawing from tradition 
and saying, this is important, this is important. And here is something from Shastra, which is not relevant for us now. And this is a major function of the guru. Take, for example, again, we spoke of Hari Bhakti Vilasa. The Hari Bhakti Vilasa is, it's like an encyclopedia of deity worship. Prabhupada said, if I told you everything that's in that book, you would faint. Yes. There's so much detail there. You can spend all day and all night doing puja, if you like. But Prabhupada said, here's what's important. Everything should be on time. <laughs> and everything should be clean. <laughs> Those were the two main things he emphasized. <laughs> Get the off, get the RT on time, and keep everything. Uh, he said, "Revolutionary clean." Mm. And then everything else was kind of details. <laughs> um, but he he also said, you know, you can learn uh, to do more, more of the uh, the rituals, the practices, and so on. Um, so the guru, the point was that the guru. One of the important functions of guru is selection, helping us to select what's important from the tradition and setting aside what is not important or what is not relevant uh, or which is somehow even obstructive uh, to our uh, spiritual life. Oh, this is a beautiful understanding that so tradition is more like a resource that we draw on to equip us to say face the world and engage with the world and serve serve Krishna in the world. So just that's that's one way of putting it. Yes. I didn't complete this. What I was saying is the way I had earlier heard this verse was say Guru Sadhu Shastra Vakya Ikya. It was more that make your heart one with the words of Guru Sadhu Shastra. But the way you are reading is that yeah. in your heart, make them one. And that's a, a, yeah. a more, I would say, more realistic understanding because Guru Sadhu Shastra is not always one. So if I want to make right. my heart one with Guru Sadhu Shastra, well, if they are saying three different, they are saying different things, then with what do I make it one? So rather, these are three sources of knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Rather, these are the three sources of knowledge. And then we draw from them and make them one in our heart means that uh, we take them, we draw upon them and uh, find the necessary wisdom for applying in our situation. So is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, yes, but all of which is only possible by, by the grace of Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. Huh? especially we approach Guru uh, to, to make it possible for that to become a clear aikya, a clear unity in the heart. And, and yes, if you try to make, if you go the other way around and you try to sort of unify yourself with Sadhu Shastra Guru, you may be very easily confused. Not only do you have three sources, Depends how many sadhus you're approaching. Yeah. <laughs> if you've got five or ten sadhus, you know, and they're and they're all saying different things, <laughs> it can be quite <laughs> could be quite difficult. <laughs> when guru itself is maybe one, but guru can say different uh, things about the same issue at different times. That also, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then this, so, so this is not just an intellectual exercise. It is, as you said, that we need the grace of these authorities, but ultimately it is we who have to do it. It's, we, it's putting the responsibility on ourselves. Um, and it's also, um, Narutam Das Thakur is indicating what is the test of whether this has worked. Is, is there an, a blossoming of Krishna Prema or not? 
if not, then you know we haven't we haven't gotten there yet. That's a that's a very pragmatic test also, because sometimes we get caught in many cultural things. Say, for example, the some of Prabhupada's statements can seem uh, racist or sexist or whatever. But then even if we apply those statements, if somebody thinks that they'll be faithful to Prabhupada by applying those statements, literally, the result is not the blossoming of love for Krishna. The result is simply an increasing of resentment and victimhood and uh, negativity. So in that right. sense, yeah. that's a very pragmatic text. So if a devotee, say, applying this to some other issue, just as an example, this is very... I'm finding very, this very illuminating. Say, if we consider an example, so this was more of a, with the veganism was more of a contemporary issue. Yeah. If you look at it, at Shastra itself, sometimes in Shastra there are astronomical figures used, say, to describe how many bodyguards were there for Maharaj Ugrasen in the 10th canto. So, there are, many, there are places like how that. How many was it? How oh, many yeah. did he have? It was like a trillion or something like that. Oh, only. <laughs> <laughs> only. <laughs> so, there's a conversation of Prabhupada where he was asked, how do we, if we explain this to the scholars, they laugh at us. And then Prabhupada says that in all the statements in the scripture, was that the only thing you found to speak to the scholars? So, so the point is that, you know, what do we draw on from the tradition? So what you said, chittate kariya aikya, rudate kariya aikya. You know, it is, we have to find out what is relevant for the, of the what is relevant wisdom from the tradition for the audience right. and speak that. Yeah. Yeah, we don't start out telling people that uh, this ancient king had one trillion bodyguards. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah. Not very conducive to starting a conversation. <laughs> so would this apply also, say, apart from say, devote, speaking to new people, if some devotees are not able to, uh, say, rationally understand how Chitraketu could have had one million wives, or how the Himalayas can be, as described in the fifth canto, of an astronomical height, far different from what we perceive. So in the beginning, you had said that I believe and I doubt. In between, or I accept, I accept what we said, two polarities. So we could have, based on this, some, some place within the shade of gray also, that there are degrees of acceptance, or we could say suspend. Ravindra Saruprabhu had mentioned to me that there are many... Suspension of disbelief, yeah. No, he used the word suspension of judgment. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's another expression, suspension of disbelief. Yes, I think that's used with the context of fiction. If you want to enjoy fiction, then yeah. you have to suspend disbelief, yes. Yeah, but I think, um, I think you can also use it here. Uh, here, what I like to suggest, <clears throat> because... Um, as we know, the Bhagavatam calls our attention from verse number um, verse number three of the first canto uh, that the Bhagavatam is um, appealing to our uh, sense of appreciation of aesthetics. Um, and it's address, you know, it says. Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayamahura Ho Rasika Bhuvi Bhagavata. Now, one of the important rasas, although it's considered a secondary rasa uh, by Srila Rupa Goswami, is Adbhuta, is wonder. Uh, I've just been reading a, a very amazing work. Uh, from one of our devotees, Gopi Acharya Prabhu, has written a book, um, his doctoral thesis, published by Oxford University Press, on Kavikarnapura. Hmm. 
Mm. And Kavikarnapura has his own very elaborate analysis of um, poetry, aesthetics, rasa theory. And this book goes into so much detail. But one of the points that struck me is, um, I hope I understood him properly, it's quite complex. But I think he's saying that for Kavikarnapura, uh, adbuta or wonder is there in all the rasas. Okay. So, but the point I want to make here is when we hear about these astronomical numbers, what I hear is uh, Shukadev Goswami calling upon us to experience a sense of wonder. And that is a sense of, oh, this world is something so much more so much bigger, so more, so much more wonderful than I perceive or that we as a collective humanity perceive. It is so much more than what we think it is. And so the Bhagavatam, one of the, one of Shugadev Goswami's tasks is He's opening us, he's opening us up to recognize, to appreciate how limited our, uh, our awareness is so that we can, um, so that we can be open to the, you can say, utter impossibility, which is Krishna. And so it's not about trying to make these numbers somehow plausible by our understanding of, you know, astronomy and geology and whatever. For me, that's completely missing the point. So you are saying that the rational faculty is not the right faculty to use while approaching these figures. It's more of the aesthetic faculty that we open ourselves more. Yes, but, but it's using the deeper rationality <clears throat> uh, by which we can recognize how limited our rationality is. So that is something which is even talked about in science, that we know so less about the universe and that is so much more to be known. And that is fine, but when we talk about, uh, when you're talking about Krishna, for him to be able to do extraordinary things, so Krishna lifting over the hill is something which can be understood. After all, he's God. And God means he has inconceivable abilities. But say Chitraketu, he's not described as God, nor is he described as having any particular inconceivable powers. So, for him to have 10 million wives or a million wives, whatever it is. <laughs> now that, yeah. is that uh, opening us to a sense of wonder or is it just stultifying the intelligence if we take it literally? I appreciate this point of opening us, like Krishna, when Krishna re reveals the Virata Rupa, the universal form, Arjuna is stunned to see its magnificence. It's, so there is a sense of wonder undoubtedly when we see the greatness of creation or greatness of existing. Yeah. But when something mm. so obviously contradicts our rationality, then is it really, are we, it requires a suspension of, as you said, susp it all, you know, Richard Dawkins defines reason, faith as the, as belief that is contrary to reason or belief in spite of reason. Now, I don't agree with his definition, but. Yeah, that's a very, I think that's a very impoverished understanding of faith. Yes, I agree with that fully, that it's not the right understanding. But isn't this something like that? When we are asking for belief in something which is, which is completely contrary to the way things work in our experience. And there is no, mm -hmm. as I said, 
there is a rationality to understanding that god can do things which are impossible for humans but somebody who is another right. human being like us yeah just how wonderful it is that he had so many wives yeah. <laughs> think credibility a little too much i feel <laughs> okay let's let's go with uh let's go with chitra ketu and his 10 million wives um i i completely agree when i think about how difficult uh it is today for uh a responsible householder husband and wife for the husband to maintain one wife <laughs> i wonder i i really wonder <laughs> how anyone would maintain um 2 3 5 10 so what is this 10 million i another way of understanding is the i think again we need to remember that the entire bhagavatam the format except for uh several passages in fifth and some in the sixth canto which are prose it's all in the form of poetry yes and um that's something else that shastra uh that the aestheticians explain about poetry is that it's about what is called dvani which means suggestion so there's <clears throat> i'm sure you know the famous example gangayam gosha yes the village on the ganga yes it cannot mean there's some village floating on the ganga oh yeah. so then you have the next step which is um uh the non literal meaning it must mean the uh village next to the ganga um and then um that's uh that's the connotative meaning lakshana i guess it's called and then there's dvani which means the implication which is not explicit is that this was a, a place with nice cool breezes coming off the ganga and it goes a further step i just read again this is mentioned in gopinath acharya's book um there's a further implication that the the gosha is in a very in a sense very much on the ganga because uh you can see the reflection of the ganga of the village sorry the reflection of the village on the water of the ganga and so it's a very beautiful scene also mm. so for me when i read 10 million wives um for me there's an image of a king with just he had so many wives he didn't even know them he didn't even know most of them <laughs> okay and this is a good example and, yeah we can go ahead. and by the way most of what he's don't know but uh in valmiki ramayana in the unabridged edition uh dasharatha had three wives and 300 compu- uh, concubines yeah it said that i remember that then this is a good you now what you explained just now about uh, the ganga yam goshan that this is a good example of a more sophisticated tool for the dialogue between faith and doubt you now whether rather than just i accept it or i reject it so this could be very helpful for uh for avoiding as you said intellectual abuse or intellectual torture for being <laughs> yes <laughs> for getting beyond that yes yeah. yeah so maybe just one or two last questions and then i, I don't want to hold you for too long a time just okay so if you would like to as a uh, concluding speak something about your book i will provide the link for the book in the youtube description and the facebook description okay right yeah <clears throat> there's there's a new um gbc re- resolution that no one should promote their book from the vyasa son 
<laughs> so I'm not on the Vyasa Sun now. Yes. <laughs> but this is my book. <laughs> um, it's called Cow Care in Hindu Animal Ethics. It's within, it's one volume in a book series on animal ethics. Uh, animal ethics is um, a newly developing uh, subject in the academic world uh, as part of what some scholars call the animal turn. Uh, there's, uh, there's a whole broader area called animal studies uh, where um, taking all the different disciplines uh, sociology, anthropology, politics, uh, law, uh, psychology, you name it, and thinking, rethinking, thinking through all these subjects again, uh, taking seriously the idea of um, that animals need to be taken seriously. <laughs> Taking seriously that animals should be taken seriously. Okay. Um, so within animal studies, then there's animal ethics. Ethics, of course, the broader topic of philosophy uh, is asking questions about morality, but uh, it, it's it's a very fundamental major field of philosophy. How do we determine what is uh, the proper thing to do. What is the right way to act in particular situations or more generally? And how do we, um, how do we, what do we base our decisions on? How do we make these decisions of what we should do and what we should not do? Much of modern um, ethical thought is being done with the presupposition of taking God out of the picture. So now we as humans have to do all the work ourselves uh, to decide what is to be done, what is not to be done. Mm. So one of the things I'm doing in this book is suggesting how this may not be so helpful uh, to understand what is to be done, what is not to be done with relation to animals. Anyway, um, I was invited to write this book by the uh, editor of the book series, who very kindly encouraged me uh, to do so as a practitioner. He said, I like that you are a practitioner. Please write on this subject. Uh, and uh, the publisher is Palgrave Macmillan. Macmillan uh, before it uh, joined with Palgrave, was the publisher that published Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita in the beginning. Uh, oh. Now, Palgrave Macmillan is itself a subsidiary of Springer Nature, or Springer International, uh, which is an academic um, publisher which does a lot of electronic uh, publishing and in, included with the regular publishing. Uh, and they have as an option for an author to publish in what is called open access. Open access is a, a fairly recent development which, by which it becomes possible um, through a financial arrangement with the publisher that the book can be, be made available uh, legally uh, through the publisher for um, completely free access to the digital form of the book. So that's what we have managed to do. Uh, it involved some fundraising on my part, which was um, successful, a uh, lot of help from devotees. And now the book is available. And uh, as you said, you can give the link. It's good if uh, devotees take, uh, download the book if you anyone's interested in it from 
uh, the publisher's website because then uh, it gets counted. And if it's counted by the publisher, then we, then we know better how many people are downloading the book. Yes. So yes, actually, this is remarkable. Now, otherwise, especially in India, to get books published by academic, or by academic publishers, it becomes prohibitively expensive. So this is wonderful. Yes. And I, yeah, I, that's a problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm personally reading the book and it is illuminating. There's so many different aspects which are there in that book. So be wonderful if you could read it. So I'll just summarize, Maharaj. Yes. So, and then maybe you could add a few things, okay, anything I left out. So we discussed this broadly, the topic of, um, you know, to put in your words, the dialogue between faith and doubt. And you explained your, started with your experiences about how you were able to reach a broader audience by your study of Sanskrit and by your academic uh, studies. And then the main issue we discussed was, as we study scripture, and we also interact with the world. So how do we bring together faith in scripture and a reasonable approach in dealing with the world as well as in looking at scripture? So theology... Scripture plus guru plus sadhu. Yes, okay, yeah. Maybe I should use the word tradition, which includes both yeah. guru sadhu shastra. And then you explained how theology has been done in the Christian traditions in the medieval times. And we are relatively... Uh, young organization and we have still got to get things done together but educational resources are slowly being made available and you mentioned also about the hermeneutics paper will come up in the future which will be like a good resource and then specifically with respect to your book you mentioned how with respect to the modern day vegan movement and the traditional cow care how if we as practitioners consider the thought process of the vegans or the animal rights activists in general, then we can also become more conscious of the violence that is that happens when we consume milk and we can maybe become made our, make our consumption of milk a little more moderate. And then from the perspective of a spiritual understanding of all living beings, the animal rights movement can also be grounded in a more, more holistic understanding of say animal citizenship. So then toward the end, we discussed about how this, you mentioned that through your academic study, you got more sophisticated tools for bringing about the dialogue between faith and doubt. And then we discussed some aspects where that dialogue could be applied. And as devotees, if we become more trained to not think, see things in terms of black and white, that doubt is not necessarily a bad thing but that doubt and faith can exist together and we can, we can find out ways in which we can bring the words of Guru Sadhu Shastra together in our hearts in a way that helps us to deal with the world or become more equipped to face the world and serve Krishna in the world. Then that way we can be both uh, devotionally faithful as well as be rational. And then lastly, you talked about aesthetics and how the aesthetic sensibility is important when we study scripture and we don't get caught too much in the reason or rather we go towards a deeper rationality which is grounded in aesthetic appreciation of Krishna and uh, your book is a excellent example of applying this uh, constructive theologizing for uh, for devotees to see and apply in various fields also so any concluding remarks Maharaj <laughs> Thank you. That was quite a good. Su I'm impressed that you remembered all these points. <laughs> um, it's not about making compromises or something like that. It's keeping the tradition alive. It's nourishing the tradition. Krishna is speaking in Bhagavad Gita uh, so much about buddhi yoga. Buddhi yukto jahati ha ube sukrita duskrite tasmat yogaya yudhyasva yoga karmasu koshalam. Uh, yoga is the art of karma, of work, of action. 
so this koshalam, this is where we need to bring in our skill and our art uh, to uh, to make to make the tradition a living to keep the tradition a living tradition, and that's what we've seen is was so wonderfully accomplished by our previous acharyas, and our most um, immediate experience of this is, uh, of course, Srila Prabhupada and so many of his immediate followers are doing wonderful things. Uh, keep keeping enlivening uh, the tradition by engaging in the bridge building in fresh and uh, creative ways. So that's beautiful. It's not just say resolving uh, uncomfortable issues for us, but it's also right. enriching us more. It's yes, enriching us, and we enrich the world through the wisdom that we have in the tradition. Yes, my exactly. Dad. Yes, and actually, I have seen this when when we have say sufficiently sophisticated presentations by devotees presenting our philosophy in the in the contemporary world using the contemporary uh, frames of reference. It's almost yeah. like we gain a very fresh appreciation. I, I never thought of it could be like this, and this is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So, in a sense, we could say this is what is realization, isn't it? Yes. We, yeah. Yes, Maharaj, that's beautiful. Thank you very much for your time and your very intellectually and devotionally stimulating uh, discussion. I hope that in future we can continue this discussion on... Well, thank you and... Thank you very much. Yes, we can do something again. And all the best for your podcast. I appreciate that you are uh, bringing up... Uh, such subjects and you're interviewing uh, so many uh, important uh, important devotees and this is very good what you're doing. It's a nice service. Thank you very much for your good blessings, Maharaj. Humble obeisances. Obeisances. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj.